think this will work. I was hands free before hands free was cool. <laughs> so you all can go ahead and uh, continue eating. It's great to be here uh, this morning. And uh, pardon me, I promised myself that I wasn't going to start out with a blimp joke. <laughs> but I am rather angry because that thing is less than a year old and it can already cross state lines. It wasn't until I was 12 till I could cross the street. Come on now, what's going on here? Uh, my, it is great to be here, and um, I was honored uh, to be asked to be today's guest speaker, and I promise I won't keep you too long because I think there is some dessert coming here later. Uh, but I am a public speaker. I've been in public speaking for about 20 years, uh, actually a little over 20 years now. And um, I go to different uh, schools, churches, uh, been in, uh, to some prisons, some camps, uh, pretty much of you name it, I've been there um, over 23 different states. Um, I've been to Canada, I've been to Mexico speaking, and uh, it's just an honor to be here with you this evening. Uh, you know, you guys can go ahead and laugh at my jokes. That's one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the, the icebreakers, you know. Uh, it's like, for instance, somebody asked me before, did you always want to be a public speaker? And I said, no. I was going to be an arm wrestler. <laughs> in fact, that movie, Over the Top, with Sylvester Stallone, I was first pick. But I really didn't need the money, and I felt bad for Sly. I let them choose him instead. Uh, so you know how that goes. My second choice was a dentist. Why is that funny? I haven't found any, uh, any volunteers for me to uh, practice one yet. But imagine if I was your dentist you would be going to the foot doctor to get your cavity fixed. <laughs> you say, well, why all the armless jokes? I was born uh, in September of uh, 1977. I was born without any arms. So if you can just imagine your shoulders being rounded off uh, with nothing there. And uh, the lower half of my body was born with just one half of a leg. Uh, on the right side, I have uh, basically the bottom portion of my leg with my foot. And I use my foot just like you would your hand. And uh, it's so interesting to see people's reactions when they see me. Uh, I've had a little, little child say, Mommy, he's not real. No. You know, it, it is so, uh, so cute and so uh, uh, awesome on how honest they are. Uh, you know, I've had little kids come up to me and say, you know, I feel sorry for you. And I try to explain to them that we are all born for a reason. We're all here for a reason. We're all unique. And uh, Mark was uh, mentioning that I speak on uh, depression and bullying. Well, you know, bullying occurs because of one of two things. Let me give you the two reasons I believe bullying takes place. Number one, because the person that is being bullied does not like themselves. If I don't like you, why should I? Uh, if, you, if you don't like you, why should I like you? You know, if you sat in the corner somewhere, well, how about this? How about if I sat in the corner today and just cried and complained and said, well, I was bored though, I was I can't do anything, and just wanted to just cry on your shoulder, would you really want to spend a whole lot of time with me? Not really, if you'd be honest with me. So if you don't like you, why am I going to like you? The second reason that bullying takes place is this. Think about this. Let's say, for instance, everyone here is picking on me. You're bullying me right now. And you're bullying me because I'm the only person here, as far as I can see, this, uh, this afternoon in a wheelchair, correct? Okay, so everyone here is, is bullying me, picking on me because I'm in a wheelchair, because I'm different. But wait a minute, look around. Look around. Don't look at me, look at someone else. Some faces you might not want to look to too, you know, too long because you are still trying to eat, so skip over that face and go to another one. <laughs> But now, all kidding aside, point to someone else in this room that's just like you. You can't. We're all different. Uh, some are short, some are tall, some are skinny, some are fat. Uh, some have brown hair, some have no hair. You know what they say, hair today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> We're all different. And if people that are doing the bullying would just stop for one minute and think, wait a minute, I'm picking on this person because they're different, but they're just as different from everyone else as the person that they're bullying is from everyone else. So if we would just realize that we're all here for a reason, that we all need help doing something uh, in life, we're all gonna need help from sometime uh, in another, right? And if we realize that, then we can just go through life a whole much uh, happier, 
person than what we are today. When I was born, the doctors immediately took me from my parents. You know, I have two children, I have two boys, and when my children were born, the most important thing that we realized was the first hour after a child is born, that mother-child bonding time. My parents didn't get that. They immediately took me from my mom. Technology, almost 40 years ago, is a whole lot different than it is today. When my children uh, were, after they were conceived and my wife was pregnant with them, uh, they took the 3D ultrasound, and we could tell they looked just like me. They had my nose, my eyes, some of you met my children, and they look like, uh, they look just like me, right? They have my wife's arms and legs. <laughs> I have a 10 month old and uh, we, we're taking, we have a, a betting pool, okay? And uh, you can get in to see uh, who's gonna walk first, me or my 10 month old. <laughs> but see, they didn't have that kind of technology back then. So when I was born, they immediately took me from my parents. The doctors came in with a clipboard they said, Mr. and Mrs. Hudson, uh, here's some paperwork. Your, your son uh, was born and you're, you're not gonna want him. So this paperwork <coughs> is going to sign your son over to the state and we're gonna take care of him and basically just feed him until he dies. That was pretty much their attitude. My parents took that clipboard. My parents looked it over. My mother handed it back to the doctor. She says, I'm gonna sign your paperwork, but not this paperwork. I'm gonna sign the paperwork that allows me to take my son home because we're going home. He's my child, and I'm gonna raise him just like I would any other child. And that determination, <laughs> that determination for my parents, I believe is one of the reasons that I have become uh, the strong person that I am today. Basically, I don't take no for an answer. I really don't. Do you know how many times I've been told no? Do you know how many times, uh, just like any other child, I have dreams and aspirations uh, as a teenager. In fact, even as a young adult, I would tell people, I still have three things in life that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna move out of my parents' house, I'm gonna get married and have a family, and I'm gonna drive a vehicle. I can take you to somebody that lives within 10 minute drive from here, sit down at, that, in, at his uh, kitchen table tonight, and he would tell you that when I told him that, 15 years ago, he thought I was the craziest person ever. And just a few, few years ago, he had my wife and I, and I and, my, and our firstborn over for dinner. We sat there eating, and he says, you know, remember that discussion we had? I said, yes, sir. He said, I thought you were foolish. <laughs> I had no clue that anything like that would ever come about. Look at you now, you're married, you have a boy, you no longer live with your parents, and you can drive. One of the key things that I try to tell people is this, the only person that can hold us back is us. <clears throat> I'm the only person that can hold me back. I'm not going to allow you to hold me back. I've had so many people say, you can't drive, you're not gonna be able to work a full-time job. I remember the first job that I got, uh, Doris is in here, uh, but Doris helped me uh, get my first and my second vehicle. $93,000 worth of equipment modifications need to go into a vehicle uh, that I can drive. And I can remember applying uh, to, to get this uh, financial aid from Doors. And they said, well, in order for us to help you, you need to have a job. And I didn't have a job at the time. To be honest with you, at that time, I was on SSI and I was just living life, one day at a time, just receiving free money. And then I was like, well, you know, I need a job and I can work. There's no reason that I shouldn't be just like everyone else. If I wanna drive, I gotta put gas in my car. I shouldn't have to wait for someone else to do it for me, right? So I went out and I got a job. I applied at Best Buy in Bel Air. I had applied there about two years before that. I had a, a friend that I went to high school with. She says, I'm the general manager. Put an application in, I'll hire you. Put my application in, went in for my interview with this girl that I graduated high school with and she looked at me and she says, I am very sorry, I can't hire you because if you were to sell a computer, and it was on the top shelf, how would you get it down? So I was a little discouraged. I said, you know what, the timing just isn't right. So a few years later, when I needed a job, I needed to uh, have that job to, uh, to continue the process with doors, I went back, found out they had a new GM. It was so funny, my dad dropped me off that, that morning for my interview. And the GM looked at me, his name was Chip. And he goes, uh, come on, let's go. So I start following him. 
And he turned around and he looked at me, and I'm the only person in the aisle besides him. He goes, where'd your dad go? I said, my dad went home. He said, well, why isn't he coming back here with us? I said, you're not hiring him too, are you? I didn't know if I was going to have to, you know, fight my dad for a position, you know. I'm like, wait a minute, my dad's already got a job, you know. He better not be taking mine too. And uh, he says, well, we've got paperwork that we're going to have to fill out. Okay. And? Well, I'll fill it out for you. I said, I'm capable. I can do it. And, and that interaction right there allowed his brain to start working and say, hey, wait a minute. I may be limiting this guy, but he's not limiting himself. And you know, he was the very first person that gave me a job. He's the very first person to look beyond, wait a minute, what can't he do? And instead, his attitude was, what can he do? I moved on from there, and for 15 months, I was a uh, call taker for the uh, Hartford County Dispatch Center up, uh, up in Hickory. And uh, so if you called 911 back then, uh, I more than likely hopefully helped you out. Okay, I moved on from there. I really didn't like the hours. I was working overnight, and I'm a night person, but I don't want to spend my night working. I want to be home, sleeping. So I ended up working for Comcast. I've had several different jobs, and then now I am so blessed to be working with the Image Center, working with people that are aging, people that have disabilities. And what I do with the Image Center is I go in and I go into the nursing homes and I just try to spread cheer. Uh, I tell them about you know, the Medicaid long-term care program, but one of my main, my main focus is to get people, uh, like for instance, uh, I have Crystal with me today, she's my honored guest. Uh, her and I, we were in a nursing facility last week and there was a lady sitting in a bed. She's probably, what, about mid-50s? Yes. And she had COPD. COPD is not a reason that you can't walk. Okay, yeah, you may be limited in how far you can walk, but you know that lady hasn't gotten out of bed in months. She hasn't even left her room in months. And you know what my goal is? When I go back there uh, uh, every other month, when I, when I go back there, I'm going to look at her. I'm going to go in there and say, hey, let's go outside. Let's go down to the rec room. Well, I can't. I'm afraid I'm going to fall. Really? Get back up. You're only defeated if you fall and you say, you know what, I can't get back up. Or I'm not going to get back up. Because remember, only I can hold myself back. So if you're here this afternoon and you are a person that has employed a person with a disability, with the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. Thank you for not limiting them. Thank you for allowing them to express themselves as, a, uh, as an adult. As a human being, we all have freedoms. We all have uh, a, a sort of independence that we want, that we desire. And if we hold them back, their life is not going to be that good of a quality of life. And if you're here this afternoon and you were born with a disability, thank you, especially if you're employed, for not allowing your disability to become an excuse. You may have a disability, but a disability means you just have to perform a task a different way than other people. I may not be able to walk, but I can get here today because of my wheelchair. If I woke up this morning and said, you know what, I'm not going to be able to go because I can't walk. Who held me back? Me. I did. If I put out an excuse for every time I had an ache or pain, I would never get out of bed. If I have it, it hurts. I have uh, arthritis in like 90% of my body, and I never feel like getting out of bed. But you know what? I get up each morning because I have a purpose. Because I determined in my heart that I'm going to have a family, that I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to be a successful person in my community. Thank you so much for the honor of allowing me to speak today. Thank you.